All right, and we are live. Good morning, everyone watching. Uh, it is October 30th, Friday, October 30th, heading into a Halloween weekend, yeah. uh, no less. So, And we are here with the great Luba Mason, vocalist Luba Mason is joining us from, are you in New York, Luba? I am, right in the city in Manhattan. Oh, wow. So we'll yeah. de we definitely want to talk about that and what New York is like. But for people watching and people who don't know, <laughs> Luba is a obviously a jazz vocalist and actress. She's been on Broadway. Uh, she was most recently in the play um, or the musical, rather, uh, "Girl from North Country." Is that right? Yeah, right. Bob Dylan musical. Yeah, an adaptation of Bob Dylan. Um, and where was that playing? Um, wow, at the Belasco Theater on Forty uh, Fourth Street, I think it is. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And the other big news is you have a new album just yeah. released last week called Triangle. Yeah. Uh, I picked it last week as one of my editor's choice albums. Mm -hmm. It's a phenomenal album. Uh, you know, your voice is just so engaging. And, you know, I love some of the, the material you pick for this album. Uh, I think you and I have very similar taste in that, you know, uh, Paul Simon is on there. Yeah. Uh, you know, you've got the Beatles on there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, I'm curious just talking about your situation is unique. You are, well, all jazz artists, their situation is unique these days because, you know, live gigs have obviously dried up. Um, touring has obviously been put on hold. You kind of straddle two worlds in that, you know, you're in theater too, you know, and you've been on Broadway and <clears throat> gee, you're star we're starting to see signs of life from the jazz world. I know, I know artists who are getting out there trying to play, you know, outside Broadway. I mean, they've, have they announced when they'd even been be opening up totally? No, tough. no, they didn't. I mean, I think the latest uh, deadline is March 31st. They've been Oof. returning tickets through then. So we're really hoping, you know, June 1st happens. Wow. Um, I'm even hoping it might happen earlier. Uh, it really depends if we get a vaccine or, or not, I think. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And so what have you been up to during these lockdowns? You know, obviously you've given us some great music with the release of the new album, but you know, have you been keeping your chops fresh? Um, well, I've been doing a lot of benefits on zoom. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, uh, and I've got some auditions trickling in some acting auditions. Um, I've been just catching up, maintaining, you know, the house here in New York and, um, you know, I really was was um, wondering whether I should release this album or not during this pandemic, right. and um, and I'm so happy I did because it's really given me a focus. It's really been nice to concentrate just on the album and um, and putting it out there. So, um, pretty much these last couple two or three months, I've been just focusing on the album. That's awesome. You know, we're glad you put it out too because it's a lot of uplifting music on there i love the lead off track which is uh, what is it box stevie wonder and janelle monet yeah yeah by skip sherry yeah. yeah yeah and it's just the lyrics are something to the effect of you know if you see me smiling it's probably because of either bach stevie wonder or janelle monet right right and it kind of sets up the album too as far as yeah. the repertoire you know because i have such an eclectic repertoire on the yeah. album and uh, that's why I really wanted to start the, the the album off with that because my tastes really vary. And uh, and actually with Skip, I had done a, a workshop with him. He also writes uh, music for uh, for theater as well. Mm -hmm. So I did a workshop of one of his shows, and that's where I got hip to him. And um, I just started checking out his music, and I, I heard this song, and I thought this is really fun, you know. So totally. uh, and does that align pretty much? I mean, our Bach, Stevie Wonder, and Jel Janelle Monet up in your, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely Bach, Bach yeah. is you wonder, and I like some, I, I definitely like Janelle Monet. I'm not as familiar with her. Yeah. Uh, but Stevie, yeah, he's, he's pretty great. And I was a classical pianist for 13 years. So, um, right. Bach was definitely in my repertoire and, um, I loved, I loved to play Bach. He's oh, really beautiful. To play. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the new album, so many songs. And it kind of speaks to this new concept of music that you've coined, Mixtura, um, you know, which is a fusion of your sensibilities, everything from classical, like you say, all the way to pop. Um, because, God, I mean, you've got Thelonious Monk on there. you got a nice vocalese version of In Walk Bud. 
Right, uh, right. And I also have uh, a heavy metal tune, Toxicity, System of a Down. System uh, of a Down, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and a couple of pop tunes, you know, the, the jazz tunes, straight ahead jazz tunes. I have a show tune on there from uh, the band's visit, which was the best musical. I believe it was in 2018. Yeah. Best musical. It's a really, and it's actually a very hip jazz tune. Uh, Michael Bourne from WGBO, he, uh, he, I heard him play it on his station uh, a couple of years ago. And he said, this is a jazz standard that's, that some, some hip jazz singers need to cover, you know. He picked and it I, right up. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I haven't released the album yet. Yeah, it's just proof that you can really make anything swing, so to speak. I was speaking with um, Mark Free, who a, a producer over at Positone yesterday, and he said, you know, swing, we think of it a lot as the feel of an eighth note, ching, ching, ka ching, ching, ka ching, you know, like that. But it's really, yeah. swing is just this life force that great songs have, you know, and if you can kind of distill that from anything, from System of a Down, you know, Paul Simon, um, and that's what you do so, so well. Yeah, I really wanted to challenge the lineup of Triangle, yeah. which is just voice, vibraphone, and bass. And I really wanted to challenge and see, um, you know, what, what what kind of genres can 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 this uh, lineup handle? You know. Yeah. And um, and I believe we handled all of them pretty well. Yeah, no, it's a great album. And so, you. you know, let's take it back to the beginning then, because you grew up in New York, right? You grew up in New York. I did. Yeah. Astoria, Queens. Yeah. Born and raised in Astoria, Queens. All right. I lived out in Forest Hills for a little while. And I yeah, still have some what are the, out there. The, the few New York, the real New Yorkers. Out there, <laughs> right? That's right. Out there in Queens. So, uh, you know, which came first for you? I'm curious, because you were at the heart of it. Was it theater that first kind of captivated you? Or did you hear a record? That's it. What kind of put you on the path to, well, I want to be a singer? It, it really was the piano. I was a oh, classic okay. student, so I started when I was five. Yeah, and, wow. um, you know, sitting in a room and practicing two, three hours a day was not exactly my idea of what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And yeah. fortunately, my, my piano teacher was also a voice teacher, and he was also the organist in the local church uh, uh, for a choir. Mm. And... Um, my older sister was a singer, and so he wanted to check out my voice. And so, like, uh, he started to vocalize me at the end of my uh, piano lessons and realized, oh, you've got a pretty good voice. So, um, you know, the voice just eventually then in high yeah. school took over. And, um, you know, I also did see my first Broadway show when I was in fifth grade. So that kind of, that start, you know, kind of came in there. But basically, um, I because my older sister was an opera singer, wow. I, I started studying classically with her teachers, like from Juilliard and Manhattan School of Music. But I didn't want to sing classical. I really wanted to sing more pop stuff or yeah. jazz or, or um, actually more like show tunes and pop stuff is really where I started. Um, but I had a classical training, which for me, and I strongly feel uh, for most, for a lot of singers, if you're going to sing, it's it's really a great base to have as far yeah. as training. Because from there, you can go anywhere. You really can. Yeah, that makes sense. Because there is raw talent, you know, undoubtedly when it comes to singing. But it's an instrument you have to cultivate, you know, Oh, your absolutely. Voice. And it really gives you um, a lot of possibilities, really, yeah. in how you sing. You know, um, so that was a really great tool in my pocket to have. And so from there, I went anywhere. And, you know, and it also gave me the longevity of being able to sing on Broadway. Right. Eight shows a week, you know, six days a week, one day off, whether you're belting your brains out or, you know, whatever. Or right. Or a flu or whatever. You know, you've got this technique in your, in, you know, under your belt. So, yeah. Anyway, so long story short, to answer your question, I mean, it, it kind of all was, was happening at the same time. And I think as I got older, my tastes um, started to get more sophisticated. And um, actually, my husband uh, introduced me to Latin music. Ruben Blades is your uh, husband. Ruben Blades, yes. Yep, yep. And, um, he introduced me to Brazilian music, which I uh, fell in love with. And yeah. And that really also segued into the jazz as well. Right. And it was like what? And, and you know, funny, 
when I was in high school, I was a big Sarah Vaughn fan. I don't know where okay. it came from. <laughs> but that know. was that was your, I mean, because it's always, you know, Ella and Sarah and Billy. Yeah. It, was, it was Sarah who you kind I mean, of. No, listen, I mean, it was like Karen Carpenter, <laughs> okay. Sarah Vaughn, you know, Barbara Streisand, you know, then Charday. I mean, I, my tastes are very, really, really eclectic. So um, in any case, um, I think it was when, as I got older, my taste just got more sophisticated and I got more into the jazz stuff and the repertoire yeah. and the standards. And um, But I still love everything else, you know? Well, what was the first show you saw? You know, the, the first going into Broadway. I mean, that's people who grew up in New York, you know, especially in Astoria with, you know, Manhattan, just a few train rides away, the epicenter of theater essentially do you recall the first time you went to broadway what it was like the play you oh, saw yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah you know very vivid but i mean the show the magic show you know wow. it was doug henning i don't even know, if you know who that is i, I mean, know doug henning he was he was a magician yes I, well i <laughs> people who have watched this show for a long time have seen me perform some amateur magic on it oh so. really oh, oh yeah see yeah. that <laughs> Maybe one for another episode. Um, okay, all right. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I, I think it was really just the experience that kind of blew me away. It was being like, I yeah. think, walking into this building, this theater, and the lights go down, and it's live, and there yeah. are these performers on stage in costumes, and, you know, it, it was just, um, it was mesmerizing. And, and just being there and a part of that, I think, was really what turned me on. It wasn't necessarily the magic show, but it was <laughs> the whole experience, you know? Right. Um, and then I, you know, after I saw that, I saw many others. And then I went, oh, wow, you know, now, now we're getting into dancing and other, you know, singing stuff, real right. singers on stage, et cetera. Right. So, I mean, and that actually correlates to really any experience. I remember when I saw Sarah Vaughan at Carnegie Hall. Um, in high school, you know, again, it, I went by myself. Um, I just wanted to go see her, you know, perform. I think it's just the experience of the live, the live musical experience that just really turned me on. And I went, that's what I want to do when I grow up. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. And hey, by the way, we're getting some, you know, comments on Facebook. And I want to remind anybody, if you want to oh, say yeah. a hello to Luba, or if you have a question, Jeff wants to know, uh, you know, his son is getting his start on and off Broadway. Oh, wow. um, any advice? I mean, now I guess things are different. But, you know, we, we can talk about how you got your start, you know, really acting on Broadway. And then I guess we could derive from that some advice for for our friend Jeff, Jeff's son. Um. Oh, you want me to answer? Um, you know, it's um, oh, it's uh, it's hard work. So I definitely um, advise you to get as much training as possible, and to be able to do as many things as possible as possible because the 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 arts in general are just very competitive today. Really competitive. Yeah. There's a lot of kids out there. I have a niece who is uh, going into musical theater. And, um, you know, I just watched her go through all these college exams and, and um, auditions, getting into schools, and the competition is fierce. So, you know, if you want to do theater, um, mm -hmm. musical theater, you know, you got to learn to sing as many different styles as you can, dance, get the acting under your belt. Um, you know, and also really important, which I didn't do that much of, was really um, study the business aspect mm. of show business. Yeah. That's really important. That is great advice, you know, for, for jazz artists too, for any artist really. You know, you know, because it's not just about your talent anymore. It's really, you know, there's a lot of luck involved. But um, if, if, if you've got the talent and you've got some business savvy behind you, you know, you can at least make the maybe some better decisions and, yeah. and navigate your career better and uh, open more doors for yourself. Yeah. And now because you do so much, you know, between and we should mention you've acted, you know, on television as well. Yes. Um, which I know is a whole another ball game. It really is. <laughs> 
Because <laughs> in theater, it's like you're bigger than life, and you got to play to yeah. you know a thousand, fifteen hundred people in the audience. And now on television, you're playing to like a lens this big, or maybe this big. Right. Right. Everything yeah, just gets really small. Squash. Right. Yeah, like the lift of an eyebrow. But it's still got to come through. Exactly. You know, could, is huge. You know, it's all. There's right. a lot, you know. Right, right. So, um, yeah, you got Is that a similar scale for like, let's say, theater and then a cabaret set or like a jazz set? You know, do you find in theater it's much more performative in a in a oh, just, Yeah, cabaret is just so intimate. Yeah. Um, and that's such a beautiful medium as well. Um yeah, I guess so. I, I mean, you, people are still bigger than life in cabaret. It really depends on the true. subject, on the subject of your of your show or yeah. what you're doing. Um, but yeah, you don't you don't necessarily have to be as big. You have the option, at least there, of of going really small if you right. want. Right, right, and a lot um, of power in that. Yeah, so you have you definitely have that option in in theater if it's a large audience or. You know, it's it's tricky. You you gotta you gotta reach the back row right. or the yeah. Top of the balcony. Yeah. Now, with with regard to acting, did you you know you were classically trained in piano? You were classically trained in voice. Um, did you go through any of the methodology uh, for acting? You know, what are the big uh, uh, not Stravinsky? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, for like, like Strasberg. Or Strasberg. Or and, or yeah. Like yeah, I went actually because I had so much training in music and voice before I went to college. I wanted to study drama at college. So I went to NYU School of the Arts okay. and I was a drama major and oh, wow. I was just straight ahead drama for four years. And boy, was that a learning curve because, you know, I was the big star in high school of the high school musical. And then you get into, um, you know, college and, and you're studying Chekhov and Ibsen and, right. you know, Shakespeare. And it's like, whoa, this is right. not, you know, cabaret. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was a real learning curve for me. As a matter of fact, I was on probation my first semester in act in at the, I went to Circle in the Square, which was affiliated with NYU. I was on probation. I had, like, they gave me a D minus. Um, you know, because I just, I, w I was just a nervous wreck. It was, it was really scary. It was like a whole new, you know, lesson I was learning and acting. And um, right. I was just, anyway, um, that, that went up to an A by the time All I right. graduated, but I mean, I stuck it out. And, um, you know, that's another thing I want to give advice to, to the guy um, who's got a son in, in theater, you know, you really, you got to believe in yourself and you really, you really have to have a drive and you really have to want to want it. Right. You know? and yeah. It's, it's, and you know, that's, that's, um, uh, that's interesting be because you've straddled both sides, right. Been on, you know, the theater part of musical theater and the musical part of, of, of musical theater. Um, do you think that, again, just knowing the context mm -hmm. of a lot of these great American songbook songs, and how they originally appeared in musical theater and what they were intended to do yeah. to advance the narrative has helped you perform them. Excuse me. Does, does that help the way you interpret them and perform them? And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think even some of the reviews for triangle for the album I just did um, some, some of the reviewers even commented that they felt like my acting chops, you know, sunk into the music. I mean, right. it's really about, I mean, listen, a song is a monologue, except right. you're singing it. I mean, the lyrics are everything um, to me, um, you know, and if you've got a great voice, you know, great. Um, but a lot of times it's even just stylistically, you know, you don't necessarily have to have the greatest voice to, to put a song across. But yeah, it definitely came in handy, the acting stuff with when you're performing, you know, you really want to get the song across to your audience. Right. And, and even just for instrumentalists, you know, not necessarily vocalists to know Absolutely. the lyrics, yeah. to know the context of the song, to know what, if I were a bell, you know, how it fit into the play, you know, Absolutely. someone to watch over me, what it meant. I loves you, Porgy, what it meant to the, to the show itself, I think is hugely important. Absolutely. Yeah. I totally agree with you. Yeah. Um, one thing I always love 
uh, to ask again, you know, performers like you who are in musical. I'm a musical theater nut. Um, are you really? I, I love musical. Yes. <laughs> I, you know, a lot of people take me for a stuffy jazz guy. No, I love Sondheim. Um, oh, he's you know. awesome. Yeah. Talk about lyrics, man. Exactly. Ooh, and, and singing his material ain't, ain't easy. Oh, I, well, that's exactly what I was going to ask. You know, are there artists, you know, for me, it's Sondheim, who you would like to see covered more in a jazz context? Mm. You know? Wow. It's hard to say because, I mean, stylistically today, I think a lot of the composers are pretty flexible. That's true. Uh, the, the compo one of the composers that I cover on my album is David Yazbek. He wrote mm -hmm. the music for A Band's Visit. Right. And, I mean, this tune is could be considered a jazz standard anywhere. Right. And, but the material in his show, I mean, it, it deals with the Middle Eastern, you know, theme. So, um you know, he definitely had to incorporate that into the music. Right. But this is also the same composer who wrote um, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, which is like a real typical musical theater show. Right. So, um, I don't know. I mean, so, some of them are really adaptable. Um, I don't know. I, I, I can't think of anybody specific per se i'm even thinking of like lin-manuel uh, miranda oh, sure hamilton i mean he's definitely out of the hip-hop um you know uh musical theater he's straddling those worlds um yeah but even with lin if you listen you know and i know this is uh, in part due to his uh, musical director as well he's working some very complex harmonies and chord changes into oh. tunes you wouldn't notice it. it's like putting the pill in the applesauce yeah i was listening yeah. I was like dang is that a diminished sixth chord and he's substituting this here and it's like in a right. hip-hop tune and right. it's just so smooth yeah. um and rhythmically so, too yeah I mean, yeah it's yeah crazy. so yeah to your point that's a good that's a good point modern composers are working more styles you I know so. it's not I all rogers and hammerstein gilbert no, and Sullivan. it's, it's not like, it's not yeah. I mean, and, and i even cover a song say it on my album uh triangle uh frank lesser is uh, mm -hmm. did the music for that with jimmy McHugh, and it's you know frank lesser wrote how to succeed in business without really trying i right. mean which which i did on broadway wow. and and i remember when i chose this song i didn't even know frank wrote it and um i went whoa okay this guy was was doing the standards thing psycho right. is another one I call um, you know, I was in one of his shows. I did uh, the Will Rogers Follies, which is like, you know, a real <laughs> theater kind yeah. of a show. But, you know, this guy was pulling standards out, you know, left and right. So uh, it's interesting. You know, I, th I think composers are pretty flexible. You know, yeah. it really depends. What was your first Broadway show? First time on Broadway? Uh, it was called Late Night Comic. Okay. We opened on a Thursday night and we closed on a Sunday afternoon. Hey, it happened to the best. Uh, Sondheim has, you know, had some clunkers too. So yeah, so it was it was a flop, as they say. But you know what? It was my dream at the time to get on Broadway, and I did it. Yeah, yeah. I mean that. Take me to that moment. The lights go. You know, curtain parts. Like yeah. lights go up and on Broadway. And I, I had a Broadway show on my resume. Yeah. So here you go. Just, you know, keep on, keep on, you know? Yeah. How about any other memorable ones you really, you know, think fondly on your time in that cast and that ensemble? Um, well, geez, I, I have to say I did Paul Simon's The Cape Man. Wow. And um, again, it was not a big hit uh, with the critics, uh -huh. but man, working with Paul and I also met my future husband, you know, okay. Ruby in the cast. I mean, that show was pivotal for me in so many ways because not only did I meet my my future husband, but it it just musically it opened yeah. me up because it was an entirely Latin cast. Okay, Latin music all of a sudden be became a part of my repertoire. Right. I mean, I I never ever listened to Latin music in my life, and. Yeah. All Sudden, I'm surrounded by it, and I'm hanging out with a guy who is like, you know, Mr. Icon of salsa, and yeah, um, and he's the one who turned me on to Brazilian music. So it was like, 
um, it, 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 and you know, it was, it was just, that show was really pivotal for me in my life. It just really opened me up musically. Um, and very, and, and funny enough, my husband, I only knew him as an actor when I got into the cast. Oh. I didn't know a musician at all. <laughs> and I remember him opening his mouth in the show and I'm like, oh, he's wow. a pretty good singer for an actor. <laughs> That's the boom guy that I am. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, that 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 show was pretty pivotal for me, and um, and I also have to say when I did Chicago on Broadway, mm. um, I played Velma Kelly opposite okay. Brooke Shields, who is my Roxy Hart. Wow. What was really crazy for me in that show was. Um, like my second Broadway show that I had seen when I was younger was Dancing. Okay. By Bob Fosse and Ann Ranking was one of Bob Fosse's um, best dancers at the time. And so anyway, I saw her on on stage and I saw her wow. slithering around this pole on stage and I went, wow, that's really what I want to do. And she became like this person that I looked up to, this icon. And when I got into Chicago, um, I was coached by Ann Ranking for the role, to, to do the role. And it was just like a, a total, you know, uh, what do they call it? It's, uh, I came full circle. Yeah. You know, kind of like seeing her when I was little and looking right. at her. Idolizing her. But there she is coaching me and putting me in a show. So um, Did da dancing come naturally to you? Had you always been dancing or was this kind of... Um, you know that that's that's another story. At the, my at the end of my last year in at NYU, I had eight credits to kill, and there was a new program with the American Dance Machine where I could take eight credits of dancing, and I didn't have much training in dancing, so I started studying with Lee Theodore at the American Dance Machine to get college credit. Right. And she really dug me in class and took me under her wing and put me in her company the day after I graduated from college. So wow. I was a dancer for like the next five, six years. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, that's where the, that training started. And um, I never considered myself like a real full fledged dancer. I mean, I had some training and I was very coordinated and I picked up very quickly, but um you know, there are dancers who, I mean, I studied singing for, you know, 12, 15 years. I studied piano for 13 years. You know, I did not do that with dance. I mean. Um, but even just to get that training, you know, that too, I oh, think is important in a lot of ways because it internalizes rhythms, you know. And again, if. You absolutely. Know? Absolutely. And, and it was like. Um, the, the company was like an, a living archive. We recreated the original choreography of yeah. past Broadway shows. So there was a lot of period dancing um, in the, sh and I remember in class, we used to go into the 1930s dance uh, movements mm -hmm. and that's all like the samba, the merengue, the, yeah. the uh, you know, and we had a conga player in class as well for that period. And all of those rhythms just came really natural yeah. to me. And that I carried over into some of the Latin and the Brazilian stuff that I started singing. So yeah. it's interesting how everything starts to connect. and Totally. And, you know, the triple threats like you are getting rarer and rarer. I was just speaking to someone the other day who was saying, you know, you know, look at someone like Gene Kelly who could sing, dance, and act, and just the way he carried himself on screen. You could tell even when he was walking, you know, there was some kind of presence oh, about I this him person. So much. You I know? just saw him in Singing in the Rain like last week. It was um, <laughs> no, oh, we love that's a favorite in our house as well. He was like sexy. He was like oh, yeah. a high dancer. You know, <laughs> you know? and so like it's rare. And so the person I was talking to about this is, was another fan of, of musical theaters. And we were kind of just lament of musical theater. We we're kind of lamenting the fact that you don't see, you know, movies like the kind Gene Kelly was in or people like, you know, Gene Kelly on screen, you know, in theater anymore, you know? So it's, it's reassuring to have Luba Mason come on and know that there are still triple threats out there. Oh, you thank know, you. thanks. Doing her thing. Well, don't ask me to do any dancing anytime <laughs> soon. That's for sure. 
No, but you know, we were talking a little bit uh, before. You said you mentioned you may want to uh, do some singing here. Um, and uh, obviously, we would love to hear that. You know, that'd be a real treat. A real treat on this day before Halloween. Um, so if if you're if you're still into it, you can sing as, as much or as little as you'd like. All right. Um, okay, I'll do this. Skylark, have you anything to say to me? Won't you tell me where my love can be? Is there a meadow in the mist where someone's waiting to be kissed? Skylark, have you seen a valley green with spring where my heart can go a journey over the shadows and the rain? To a blossom-covered lane And in your lonely flight Haven't you heard The music in the night A wonderful music Faint as a will-o'-the-wisp Crazy as a loon Sad as a gypsy Serenading the moon Oh, Skylark I don't know if you can find these things But my heart is riding on your wings so if you see them anywhere, won't you lead me there? Just beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Oh my beautiful. God, I have <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> Bravo. No, that was stunning. Thank you. What a treat. Yeah. Hoagie would be proud. Um, absolutely beautiful. So, uh, yeah, and then, you know, obviously we're getting a plug. People are throwing flowers oh. courtesy of Facebook. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I, I so, like too. Yeah. Great. Luba, um, you know, you and your husband, Ruben Blades, uh, as we move into what, what do you got planned for the weekend? What's going on in New York? This is, you're a native. This is your city. Yeah. You know, Oh, I dig it. I dig New York so Yeah, much. it's still because you read online, you know, oh, new people leave. It's a ghost town. People are leaving in droves. No. And I'm saying that cannot be the case. This no, certainly no. can't be the case. It's really not. It's, um, you know, it's it's not a ghost town at all. Not like some people say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, at all. It's um, pretty much the traffic is pretty much there. The foot traffic is there. Um, I mean, really, the only difference is you see all these restaurants with their outdoor mm -hmm. eating, um, areas, which I actually I love. It kind of reminds me of Europe a little yeah. bit. It's beautiful, but it's getting a little cold. Um, but it's kind of normal. I have to say, I mean, other than everybody wearing masks, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, it's pretty normal. Uh, but that's, I think, going to be our new normal. To, be, to yep. be honest, um, and everybody's been really good about wearing the masks. So I think so far, knock on wood, um, you know, I think the numbers in New York, as far as people getting more COVID and you know, the the numbers rising, I think it's we're still pretty good in New York. People are being great about wearing the masks. That's so, good. You know, come on down. I mean, it's. I think it's. It still feels like New York. This is. Your New York. Yeah, it really is. Good. It really is. Good. Well, I'm yeah. glad to hear that. Yeah. Uh, Luba, this has been amazing. Again, uh, what a treat going into Halloween weekend. I've got a, car a pumpkin to carve a little later with oh, my daughter. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's <laughs> oh, my daughter, who's the big Gene Kelly nut, by the way. Oh, she is. She yeah, is. she's only three. Yeah, I got to go get some candy <laughs> just in case there's some trick or treaters. I don't know. I'm not sure. That's right. Um, I get go ahead. Uh, I was just going to remind people that the new album, if you yeah. liked this rendition of Skylark and, and Luba's beautiful voice, you know, you can hear it on this wonderful new album, uh, Triangle, 
out on. And I want to say um, I've got a couple of great um, musicians on this album. I've got Joe Locke on vibraphone. Yes, let's shout them out. James Genus on bass. And um, these guys are real pros and uh, were just great to work with. They, they just got the project immediately. And I also have Samuel Torres. He, he makes a guest appearance on, on a couple of tunes with, his, with percussion. Um, and it was also produced, uh, co-produced with uh, myself and Renato Neto, who was a uh, collaborator and keyboardist for Prince for many, many, many years. Wow. Uh, I just wanted to name those those jazz folks out there. Um, they're they're they were great. Absolutely happy to shout them out. Uh, again, it's out on Blue Canoe Records streaming purchase. It's an awesome record. Highly recommended. Has my stamp of approval. Uh, Luba, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll sign off with you. I'll, we'll we'll move you backstage to our green room, um, okay. and I'll see you there. But I'm going to sign off with people watching at home. But thank you so much. This was this was awesome. Oh, such a pleasure, Brian. Thank you for having me. Really. Very welcome. Okay. See you, Luba. Ciao. So thanks again to our guest, Luba Mason. Again, the album Triangle. It was my editor's choice last week. It's out right now on Blue Canoe Records. Go stream it. Go buy it. Now's really the time to buy it. Let's support these artists. And uh, yeah, that'll do it for today's show. Uh, we'll see you again on Monday with another episode of Miles Monday. Until then, have a great weekend. Uh, happy Halloween. Follow us on Facebook. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Hit that notification bell so that you know when we're going live. That'll do it for me. I'm Brian Zimmerman. See you next time, everyone. Bye.